according to a risk of, if, by the way, they're not the fan letter. That's the kind of the, uh, this actual fan letter. Dear Brandon Sanderson, you son of a bitch. <laughs> For years, my family and I have raised the biggest herd of prized chihuahuas in the North American continent, and then I just got through books. With every page turned, I screwed in surprise and dropped the books, and slowly I've killed off all the chihuahuas. <laughs> so unfortunately, you've changed my whole life. But now I have wonderful books and no dogs, and it saved me a lot of money. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> I say this is a joke because, you know, I've been carrying around those books all day for a time, which of course they did, and, and now I have to go see a chiropractor. So a lot of people were thankful for these books that we jokingly call chihuahua killers in the industry. Mm -hmm. you know, drop one on an average sized chihuahua and it's done. Um, Brandon probably needs no introduction. He is, uh, of course, a New York Times best-selling author. He's worked on the first you know, deal of time. And then he's got his own uh, Stormlight Archive. He's got uh, the Mistborn series. Uh, he's, he writes both YA and adult. He's part of a, a Hugo. He's won a Hugo Award for was it novella. I won a Hugo Award for novella and for um, uh, my podcast. Right, mm -hmm. the, for the podcast, and as a writer, he's also one. He is um, also a teacher. He is a professor of writing at Brigham Young University, and uh, generally all around a pretty successful, nice guy. So we're going to talk to him, and I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to start out with a couple basic questions, and I'm going to take questions from you guys for 15 minutes. Then I'm going to do a few follow-up questions to expand on things, and then we're going to have him read for us. Is that okay? Whichever <laughs> novel I pick in 15 minutes, the whole time. He's a speaker. So you might want to pay attention and have some caffeine. I'm kidding. He will read a section from whichever book he chooses or whatever he wants. Well, I had a teacher when I was in eighth grade, and this is true. Her name was Ms. Reader. <laughs> yes, and she's now a professor in California. Um, and I was uh, what we call in the industry a reluctant reader. That is fancy terms for me you know like books. And she couldn't get me to read. I was one of these, these boys. It happens to a lot more boys than girls, but it happens to a lot of kids between about fifth and seventh grade. Um, they fall out of reading. And for me, I suddenly found books boring during that era. I, I joke about it in, in, in one of my books, actually, about you know these books with the awards on the cover with a boy who has a pet dog and then the dog dies, and that's your story. And I thought these were, were boring. I did try Tolkien, but if you're not a good reader, trying Lord of the Rings, I bounced off that so hard. Um, I had no idea what was going on. I got to the, like, the Barrow White scene, and I'm like, let's go, this is boring. Um, <laughs> that was a few years before my eighth grade year when my teacher she realized I was, I was struggling, and she realized I was faking my way through book reports. And so she called me up after class, and she said, your next book report's going to be a book that I have read. And then you're going to read it, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, so she took me to the back of the room, and teachers have these like racks of ratty paperbacks. Any teachers here? Yeah. You, maybe you have these things. It's like 100 kids have read these books. They're stained with school lunch spaghetti sauce and things like that. Anyway, these were some of her favorite books that she, um, she loaned out to students. And I browsed through those, and I found a book called Dragon's Bane, uh, Barbara Hambly. Um, nowadays, a kind of lesser-known classic of the genre. It's fantastic. It has this gorgeous Michael Whelan cover on it. Um, and it was longer than books I'd tried before, but it also looked more interesting. Um, so I dove into that book, and you know, the weird thing about this book is this book should not have worked, right? If you've read Dragon's Bay, it's about a middle-aged woman um, who is, has been told that if she would just dedicate herself to her magic craft, she could be one of the greatest magic practitioners ever. Her, her teacher keeps saying, her mentor, look, you just need to need to dedicate yourself more. Um, at the same time, she has a family, several children, and a husband who, in the, the book, is called to go slay a dragon. Um, and he's like, you know, in his 50s now, and he killed one once when he was 20, but he's the only living dragon slayer. But the story is kind of about him saying, well, I've got to go kill this dragon, and her saying, uh, you're in your 50s, you're going to get killed. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting story um, told through this woman's eyes. And it's basically a woman having a midlife crisis and trying to choose between her career and her family. 
Um, not what you would normally give to a 14-year-old boy and expect him to, to absolutely love it. But this is the power of, of fantasy. It's why I love the genre. It's why I came to love it. It's why the answer to your question. Because I feel that in fantasy, in science fiction, we can blend the sense of fan, uh, the fantastic with the sense of the familiar. And we can learn about people around us um, while having an awesome story at the same time. Uh, I remember a few years ago there were these books that would come out where you would, um, it was for uh, parents to fool their kids into eating vegetables. And you would like, they'd say, you can mix this vegetable with this food and they won't taste it. Um, I kind of actually view um, fantasy a little bit like that. Um, you can have this awesome adventure that's really fun, um, exciting. And um, at the same time, you can deal with lots of interesting real world issues. Um, but not make them pretentious. Not make them, you know, I, I read, and there are lots of great books and lots of genres, but I'll read some that are, you know, realistic fiction, and they just hit you with this moral so much um, that you, you know, you're sick of it after the third chapter. Um, whatever the reason, I, you know, I do know what the reason is. I do know what the reason that this book connected with me. My mother graduated first in her class in accounting in a year where she was the only woman in the accounting department. Um, and she had, after doing that, received a scholarship to go become a CPA. Um, and she had made the decision, you know what, I'm pregnant, I'm going to stay home with my son while he's, um, while he's a little kid until he goes back to school, and then I'll, I'll go back to a job. And as a kid, you know, when I heard the story, as a teenager, I'm like, well, of course she did, it's me, right? <laughs> you know, you're a teen, it's everything's about you. Um, you're like, well, that's, that's obviously the right um, decision. In reading this book um, and saying, you know, where it wasn't accounting, it was magic, I'm like, oh, you know, that's how my mom feels about accounting. And she gave that up. It's not an easy decision. It's not the obvious decision. Both decisions are right. She just picked one of the two and she did it for me. And so I get out of this book that's this is goofy fantasy novel about killing a dragon and I understand my mother better. And that blew my mind as, as a kid. And I ran back to my teacher, I'm like, there have to be more books like this. Um, and so she took me to the library, um, which I had not spent much time in. And um, I just went to the card catalog. You know, we have them back then, carved out of stone, pterodactyls <laughs> sitting on the sides. Um, Was there dirt? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the, the cards in the line, you read them by, um, you know, title, and the next book in line was Dragon Prince by Melanie Ron. Um, so I got into those books, and the next book after that in line was Dragonflight by Anne McCaffrey. Um, and so that was my introduction to fantasy. I spent, um, you know, the next few months reading every Anne McCaffrey, Barbara Hamley, and uh, Melanie Ron book I could get my hands on. Um, and to the point that when someone handed me David Eddings that summer, I said, I don't think guys can write this genre. <laughs> Skeptical, um, but you know that was that was that was my mentorship was those three ladies. Let's uh, take some questions from you guys. I, I think uh, let's try to focus as much on on writing and stuff as we can. No, uh, no, they can ask anything. Doesn't matter. I'll answer All right. anything. All right, then. but we do want minutes. to keep it keep away spoilery questions. Yeah, no spoilers. No um, if you spoilers. have questions like that, you can ask them during my uh, signing when we come to the line. Yeah, no spoilers. Yeah, um, uh, so the question is, how do I balance, I use a lot of religion in my books, how do I balance that with my own personal beliefs? So, um, I'm a religious person, and what this has done to me, in specific, is made me really interested in how religion affects people, or how the lack of religion affects people. Um, I, I find the, the real fun of reading and writing, um, raising interesting questions, and approaching a topic from lots of different directions, and so faith is fascinating to me. Um, I, um, I ascribe to a school of thought um, that I kind of, you know, this is a little unfair to these gentlemen, but I kind of divide it among the, the Tolkien and C.S. Lewis line. Um, those two famously were in a writing group together. Um, and um, if you don't know, Tolkien actually converted C.S. Lewis to Christianity, um, which, is, which is very interesting. Um, and they both were deeply religious people, um, and they approached it very differently in their fiction. Um, C.S. Lewis thought that fiction should be didactic and teach you a lesson. Um, and Tolkien 
repeatedly refused to tell people what he thought the themes in his books were. When they would come to him and say, it's a metaphor for World War II, isn't it? He'd say, no, it's a story. Um, and I'm more a Tolkien um, than C.S. Lewis. Um, I like when fiction, I consider myself a storyteller primarily. Um, and I hope that a good story is going to raise interesting questions, um, but that has to be focused around the, what the characters are passionate about um, and what they're thinking about. Um, and so I try to populate with my books with people who are asking interesting questions from a variety of different perspectives. Um, I said on the panel I was on yesterday, nothing bothers me more than reading a book where there's someone who has my perspective, there's only one person, and they're the idiot, um, whatever it is. Um, that they're the idiot about that I agree with. I'm like, ah, can't you at least present my side? Um, I want everyone who reads my books, whatever their religious affiliation, they see something like their own belief system in there, I want them to say, yes, he's presenting it correctly. Um, and part of that means that I have to approach my fiction in certain ways. For instance, um, I, I, I like fiction that is ambiguous to the nature of deity. If there is one, I want, you know, if, if you create a book with, um, with, with really cool atheist characters and then you say, by the way, here is this all-powerful, all-knowing, um, benevolent God that the atheist is just refusing to acknowledge, that undermines that character completely. Um, and so I, ha I create my fiction so that the people on different sides of the argument, just like in our world, have good arguments on all sides. And I, I think that, that if you present characters with interesting choices, making interesting decisions, you will, truth will rise to the top. Um, that's just kind of the, the purpose, one of the purposes of fiction is discuss these issues. So um, that's kind of a roundabout answer to your question. Um, that they, you know, as a, as a person of faith, how I approach writing my books, it's, I'm not sure if it's the right answer, but it's the answer I've been giving lately. <laughs> uh, movie rights, so let's go down the movie rights um, list for you. Um, so first, the preface about Hollywood. Um, Hollywood is full of really creative, wonderful people who want to make great films. Very rarely are they ever in charge of actually making a great film. Um, and this is, this is one of the issues with Hollywood. It's, you know, I mean, the truth is, if you have $200 million, you don't want to make a movie that makes $100 million. And the people who have the $200 million to make a film are very interested in making sure that they are not going to lose $100 million. As, you know, you can, you can totally understand that, but that means that the, they tend to want films that are very safe. Um, and to make sure, that doesn't mean a fancy film can't be safe, but to make sure it's very safe, it takes a long time to get this, get to get a green light. Um, so what they do in Hollywood is they do something that's called optioning. Because it takes so long, um, to get a film made, to convince everyone, yes, this is going to be a good film, it's going to come through. Um, they don't want to buy the rights because that's expensive um, for the fact that, you know, my, my agent said like 1 in 30 actually get made. But they also don't want to just let them sit there if they're excited about it because if they do that and they get a film rolling, someone else might snipe the rights out from underneath them. So they have this thing called an option, which is you sign a deal, um, an option deal, and that gives the studio usually for five years. The length can vary. They have um, the producer of the studio has five years to make a film, and during that, they pay you a percentage of the buyout price every year to 18 months. And at the end of the five years, they can decide to pay the rest and buy the rights, or they can let it go, and then you can sell it. You can option it to someone else. Okay. And it's really, it's really an exclusive right to sell and develop a film so they get to the point where they buy the rights there. Yeah, yeah, and so a lot of these people that are they're doing this are, um, are production um, companies, which are not the studios that would eventually fund this. Right. They got the money to fund an option, but not the money to buy outright or to fund a film. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll option it, they'll get a screenplay, they'll try to get good buzz in Hollywood, they'll try to get a star or a director or somebody attached, and then they'll take this package to the studio and say, look, We've got this star said that they'll be in this. We've got this great screenplay. We've got this option. If you'll pay the buyout and then roll us in as producers on the film, then um, we'll make this film for you. No, more because it's a, if it's a New York Times best-selling series, it'll have a built-in audience. That, right. That's part of the appeal, too. Um, so I have optioned almost everything. Um, <laughs> OK, yeah, the, the question is, Shalon from the Scrum Archive, um, being an, uh, an illustrator herself, 
um, an, an artist, gave me a, an interesting opportunity to show the world through uh, sketches and illustrations. Um, is that something I thought ahead of time? In fact, that was one of my big goals with the Stormlight Archive. Um, I wanted to, so I have this kind of feeling on, on epic fantasy. One of the cool things I love about it is the sense of immersion. And the, the epic fantasies I love the most, things like Dune, if you count that as fantasy, it's one of those hybrids, or um, The Wheel of Time, um, what they do is they really make this world real to you. Um, and that helps these characters, when, you know, I, I always say characters are most important, but if the characters are caring about things you think are silly or interacting in a world you think is, is not real, you're not gonna believe those characters. Um, and so for me, I'm always looking for how can I enhance that sense of immersion? Um, and how can I do that without burdening the reader with huge, long paragraphs of description of the world around them? And um, very early in the process of developing the Stormlight Archive, I decided I, I wanted to base a character on Pliny the Elder, um, which was one of the, the early scholars um, uh, in, in Western thought who um, did all these sketches and writing. I and mean, back in those days, a, a scientist was everything, right? You know, you know, Darwin did sketches and things like this. You, this idea that you're going to be drawing and writing and, and approaching all of the sciences and arts together as one. Um, instead of it being a person who makes food or a person who stabs other people, you're gonna do all the other stuff. Um, and that, that was a really interesting character for me because I was able to develop this idea of we're gonna put sketches in the books. Now, the Stormlight Archive, one of the, the rules for myself is these all, all the art, and there's, there's some 30 pieces of art um, plus in each book, all have to be in-world artifacts. Um, that's the sense of immersion, right? I think we maybe, have, I don't say we've lost it, but you know, it's, it's become a cliche that every fantasy novel has a map in front of it. Um, and that stretches back to Tolkien, but Tolkien's map was the map they used in the book to travel, right? It's the actual map. Um, and I like that because it says, look, here is this artifact from the world, rather than here is an illustrator from our world giving you this extra information. Um, and so I, I've taken great pains to say, well, what kind of art would they have? Um, how can I get this in the books? Where is it relevant? How does it help? And I found that this really helps, particularly with Schlamm being an actual historian, um, sketching up creatures that I don't have to spend maybe quite as long describing. I still have to because a lot of people listen to the, to the audiobook, um, and I, I still want them to get the picture, but it just helps cement those things. Anyway, that was one of my big excitements about the book for years and years, and it's why um, one, one of the things propelling me to write it. Probably doesn't hurt that Tolkien actually had artistic gifts to do art too. Yeah, yeah, so Tolkien did his own maps it. really well. So he, most, he illustrated his own books. Yeah, yeah, so most of us, most of us are just drawing stick figures and giving it to an artist to make it look good. So. <laughs> yeah, it is my pleasure. It has been an honor. Uh, for those who couldn't hear, it was a thank you for um, releasing books somewhat faster. Um, and um, a thank you for finishing the Wheel of Time. Um, you know. I've, I've been there, I picked up the Wheel of Time in 1990, so my 8th grade year was, uh, was 89. Um, you finally believe that men could write fantasy? Yes, after, <laughs> after the, uh, I talked about the Wheel of Time, <clears throat> it's funny, the, everything that I picked up while I was com coming to love fantasy um, was all a completed series, or a series in the middle uh, of being written. And so, as, as a kid, I'm like, you know, these are all famous series. I want to find one that isn't, you know, I want to find the one, what's, what's going to be, what's going to be mine, does that make sense, you know, you want to, you want to, you want to be discovering, um, and so I go to the bookstore every week and look at the new books coming out and try, try to find them, and I remember grabbing Eye of the World, the first uh, Robert Jordan book, and being like, oh, this is a big book, and I was, I was a kid with not, not much money, so if you bought a big book, it wasn't that much more expensive than a little book, but you got a much more, lot more reading in it, uh, it, was, it, was, it was good, uh, bang for your buck, so to speak, so I bought that book and I loved it. Um, and I thought, oh, this is going to be it. This is, this is, and I remember when the second book came out and it had, they had trade paperbacks in my little bookstore. They didn't get a lot of those. I'm like, oh, oh, something's happening. The third book was there in hardcover and I said, aha, I was right. Um, and so I had this like, this like sort of pseudo paternal instinct for real time, even when, when I was, you know, 17. Um, and so, but then I, I do know what it's like to wait. 
Um, and, you know, George is a, a guest here. I, I want to speak toward the fact that um, he has had a long career and given people a lot of looks. And he might be slowing down a little bit as he's getting older. We all do. Um, and he just wants to make sure those books are all right. I, I get tired of hearing people, because I've heard people do the same thing to Robert Jordan. Uh, you know, cut George some slack. Um, he spent years and years toiling in obscurity um, until he finally made it big. I'm glad he's enjoying his life a little bit um, and not stressing about making sure. You know, getting a book that size out every year is is really hard on writers. Robert Jordan couldn't keep it up. Nobody can keep it up. Um, Stormlight Archives every two years. Um, even I, being one of the more um, the more fast writers out there, I'm not going to be able to do these things every year. There's just too much going on in one. So, um, so thank you. I will try to get them to you very consistently, um, but it's going to be about every other year. Another thing to know about George is George cannot write except for his particular environment and his room. He's one of those writers. That all of us have different craft, a different thing, and I'll ask him about his in just a second. But George, you know, with HBO and them send him out to promote, and he goes to cons, he goes to He's not writing this whole weekend. Mm -hmm. There's Brandon wrote in his hotel one night, I heard. Um, on both nights. Yeah, yes. I, I, I often do that too. George can't do that, so that's a difficulty too. There are other factors involved, and people love to meet him, but when you're meeting that author, you realize that sometimes they're not able to write because they can't focus. So those things. What, let's talk a little bit. What's your, what, how fast do you write a novel? What is your, your um, how do you write it? My writing approach and how fast do I write a novel? I am. Um, I'm actually not a particularly fast writer. For those of you who are writers out there, um, I, I'll go at about 500 words an hour. Um, what I am is a consistent writer. I um, I enjoy doing this, and my average day at home will be all. I get up at noon because I'm I'm a writer, not um, you know I'm not working a desk job. I don't have a desk. I don't go to a desk. I go sit in an easy chair with my laptop. Um, <laughs> And I work from about one until five. And then um, five until nine is family time. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go take a shower every the day, go eat dinner, play with my kids, uh, you know, spend time with my wife, uh, maybe go see a movie, whatever we end up doing. And by about nine or 10, she goes to bed and I go back to work. And then I work from about 10 until two to four, depending on how, how I'm busy I am. If, I, if, if things are, if I'm ahead on schedules and things, at about two I'll stop and play a video game or something. That's goof off time. Um, go to bed at about four. Um, and it really just depends on what's going on. Um, if I'm traveling a lot, that puts a lot of stress on the deadlines. Um, and I have been traveling a lot lately. And so um, I, in those cases, I try to get some work done while I'm on the road. And it usually is not nearly as effective. Um, I'll get a thousand words out of, you know, the four hours I can sneak out of the day to, to get writing done. Um, when you're breaking that rhythm, uh, artists are creatures of habits, and that rhythm, sometimes shaking up the rhythm can be great for you, but if that shake-up is also kind of tiring, um, tiring in a good way. I like interacting with people and going to cons, but you get back up there and you're like, oh, now I've, I feel like I've worked all day, and now I've got to work all day. Um, and so, yeah, um, it, it can be rough, but at the same time, with the schedule I want to have, which is um, my goal is to re release one small book and one big book a year. Um, that's my that's my goal. One um, one adult book, one one teen book, and um, sometimes those schedules get off, and so you get one one year and three the next year. Um, or sometimes I do things like write two books instead of one. Um, I did that this year, or last year. Um, the, I wrote two um, Alloy of Liar, a Mistborn book, a second era of Mistborn book, and together they're half the length of a Stormlight book. So, um, so sometimes you'll see you'll see three or something like that. But I, I want to be releasing consistently. I want to have um, I have a, a book for teens and a book uh, for um, for. Uh, larger people who are teens at heart, I don't know. Um, it, it's hard because you don't want to put a definition on them. I don't want people to be like, oh, The Reckoners is for teenagers, therefore I don't want to read that. I don't want to discourage. I mean, I've had seven-year-olds come up with their copy of Way of Kings. Um, and, you know, I think they're strong seven Yeah, they're strong. My, my seven-year-old can barely read the Pokemon video game, so we played that together. Um, and. So, but I don't want to discourage anybody from picking up a book that they think they're going to love. 
Um, but yeah, I, I do want to be releasing one quote unquote teen book, one quote unquote adult book. By the way, it's since I've started writing teen, um, I've started distinguishing them, and it's really hard to say. Uh, I write teenage novels and adult fantasy. <laughs> That term does not always evoke the um, uh, the image I want. So I have to be very careful. You can look. Yeah, I write adult fantasy novels. Mormon. I'm a Mormon and I write adult fantasy novels. Wait, wait. I've been um, uh, <laughs> I've I've been introduced sometimes at conven conventions that are not sci-fi cons, where they you know writing uh, conferences as the fantasy guy. Um, they'll say, oh, it's, here's our fantasy man. You guys want to hear a reading? Yeah. Let me pull it out here. Thanks for your questions, everybody. Um, and um, I have the novella completed, but I have no idea when I'll be able to release it because it needs a lot of attention. In fact, I'm going to skip one of the scenes, which uh, which is broken right now. Um, and it's me doing um, space opera. So, yay! <laughs> Explosions shattered the void of space, spraying vibrant reds, yellows, greens. Each firework made Jeff flinch, but he maintained an even smile. Quite the show, eh? The shuttle pilot asked. She had a southern accent, which sounded pretty authentic, but who was he to say? It had been over a century since anyone had heard a real one in the flesh. And it's lovely, Jeff said, hoping she wouldn't notice his wince as another large series went off near the shuttle. He couldn't hear the detonations, not flying through the vacuum of space, but he imagined them. Or were those other explosions from another time? You could say this is all for you, sir, the pilot said, then glanced at him. She was pretty, with short blonde hair and a prim blue Armada uniform. A silvery sidejack gleamed on her left temple, just back from the eye. I've never flown a hero before. It's war, Lieutenant, Jeff said. We're all heroes. The shuttle flew straight through a ring of vibrant red light, sparks bouncing off of its shielding. No, the pilot said. Sorry, sir, but it's not war. Not anymore. Not thanks to you. She smiled broadly. And she was right. The war had ended. Those weren't explosions, they were signs of celebration. Vigilance and valor, it was actually over. A flight of fighters zipped past in battle formation, two slower obstructors on the outside, four in interrupters inside them, carry precious carrier at the very center. Today that carrier dropped lines of fireworks instead of bombs. Jeff found himself smiling in genuine appreciation of the festivities. He didn't need to give the crawling darkness a place inside of him any longer. It was done. Now the fun could begin. The shuttle banked around the side of a large gunship, finally bringing the adamant into view. The massive flagship was a wedge of steel and lights, tip at the front, an enormous, tip at the front with enormous wings sweeping backward, almost like a pair of crashing waves. Another sequence of fireworks burst around the adamant, and Valor, their size must have been incredible for him to make them out at this distance. Through the light show, he got a nice view of the ship's impeller plate at the back. The plate stretched long and wide like a massive radio dish. An ET EDB detonation in the center would shove the, sh the ship directly into next space, letting it travel a great distance in a short time. Of course, if the detonation was off, the blast would irradiate the entire ship and kill everyone on board. And that was the risk of modern space travel. Fortunately, mistakes were very, very rare. So how'd you do it, sir? The pilot asked. If you don't mind me asking, how'd you know what the enemy would do? You must be one hell of a strategist. No, actually, Jeff said, still forward in his seat to get a better view through the shuttle window. When it comes to tactics, I barely know my flanks from my rear guard. I'm a xenopsychologist. She gave him a blank look. I study aliens, he said. That's my life's work, both the Shahana and the Alcor. The Alcor? You mean the knockers? Sure, the knockers. I made a study of them. It wasn't too difficult to decide what the centurion would do once I teased out the specifics of his race of psychology. I passed word from my lab on FS-21 to our Armada tacticians, and they fortunately accepted my conclusions. So here we are. Wait, you're up. She cut off, blushing. You lived on a station, sir. Yes. She glanced at the colonel's insignia on his uniform, then back out the window. Jeff ignored the slight. He wasn't surprised that she expected the hero of Broken Sky, as the sidecasts were already calling him, 
to be some swarthy general and master technician, ra tactician rather than a short, pale scholar from a remote station. Armada prejudice against Stadies was silly, and most of the Armada people he met seemed to know it. Either way, Jeff really didn't care what this woman thought. The anticipation of the moment was too thrilling. Decades of war finally over, the knockers defeated in a resounding final conflict. More importantly, in the fury of the battle, the Armada's forces had accomplished something even Jeff had never thought possible. They had captured the enemy general. Well, that seems good, the pilot said. Jeff glanced at her. They were in the shadow of the adamant now, cruising along its side. Being so close only emphasized how massive the ship was, bigger than some stations Jeff had lived on. And what was that, Lieutenant? Jeff asked. Hmm? Oh, I was talking to the docking attendant. Didn't they give you authorization to basic Armada side channels? She glanced at him and seemed to notice for the first time the scar on his left temple and the complete lack of a side jack there. And Jeff rubbed the scar. Jack didn't take for me. That can happen. It has at least once. What did they send you? Uh, that we're free to dock at 14 OB, sir. She blushed again, blushed again, bringing the shuttle into another sweeping turn toward one of the smallest of the docking cubbies. There should be a reception committee there for you, sir, though I think you've missed a lot of festivities. I'm not here for the party, Jeff said. I'm here for an interview. Debriefing? The woman asked. You could say that. The adamant side here was gouged with hundreds of holes, like a field after heavy artillery bombardment. Most ships couldn't enter neg space on their own, even the massive gunships would need a transport to carry them interstellar distances. The flagship and other transports of its class were like hives. Each carried its own fleet of tiny fighters, larger shuttles, mid-sized assault craft, and powerful gunships. They all floated separately for the moment, arrayed to watch the festivities. Parties would be happening on each gunship, whose crew was like their own smaller borough within the city that made up a transport port fleet like this one. Jeff's shuttle pulled alongside a box-like cubby, then slid in like a peg into a hole, locking in place. Good luck, with <clears throat> good luck with the gaff, sir, the pilot told him. I'm sure Robert and I will have a good time catching up, Jeff said, noting the look of shock in her eyes when he called the Armada's commander general by his first name. But my interview isn't with him, it's with the Centurion. She paled even further. The knocker general? We caught him? So it wasn't common knowledge. Good. Jeff had asked for the information to be kept quiet, despite Robert's insistence that parading the Chen Shuren about would improve morale. Yes, Jeff said. That's classified information, by the way. The lieutenant nodded quickly. He wondered if she'd stay quiet. Well, discovering that his request had been followed was worth a potential leap. He didn't really care if people knew, he just didn't want Robert using the general as a showpiece, a glorified carnival act. During their years of war, taking a knocker captive had been a rare occasion, and to cap the general himself, the docking process finished, and the light above the airlock flipped to green, indicating that the seals were in place. Jeff reached up and put on his stiff formal service cap and headed toward the door. Good luck, sir, the pilot called him. With the knocker, I mean. Aliens are rarely a problem for me, Lieutenant, Jeff said, the door slide sliding open. It's humans that give me trouble. He smiled politely, then stepped off of the adamant. Now oh, this thing's longer than I thought. <laughs> Said, no one ever about one of Brandon's books. <laughs> um, so Jeff goes and meets the XO or no, the the sergeant, one of the sergeants in charge, named Chuck, and you know, has a little conversation with Robert the the gaff, um, the and then gets to go meet the knocker general. So he's wanted to do the whole time, and he's annoyed that people are not letting him. Um, Jeff stepped with Chug onto the command. Uh, you know, that's not it yet. <laughs> uh, all right, so they go and they're now at the um, at the prison uh, where they're keeping him, um, and they've met a little marine sitting outside. The marine looked Jeff up and down with a critical eye. Tall, lean, and dark skinned, the man surprisingly wore no armor and carried only a simple handgun as a sidearm. In fact, he seemed far less imposing than Jeff expected of a Marine, the Armada, Armada ship-to-ship boarding troops. The only distinctive thing about this man were his eyes. They were cracked. Like a broken window, cracks spread across the man's irises in white, starkly visible. Jeff had read something about that effect somewhere, but for the life of him, he couldn't remember where. So you're him, the Marine said. Vincent and Valor, those eyes were disconcerting when they focused on him. It almost made up for the fact that the man was basically unarmed. This is what they had guarding the most dangerous warrior in the galaxy? Jeffrey Salazar, Jeff said, holding out his hand. The Marine took it, surprisingly. Maddox, nice work, sir. 
And thank you, Jeff said, uncertain how to in interpret the pause. Why are you here, Marine? Normally the brig isn't your jurisdiction, is it? There's a knocker in there, Colonel, Maddox said. A prisoner. With all due respect, Colonel, Maddox said, that thing is the most dangerous monster we've ever faced. Every step we've taken this, in this war, he anticipated. We've been playthings to it all along. Now it's on my ship. So as far as I'm concerned, we've been boarded by a hostile force, sir. Jeff nodded slowly. I'm going to need to go in there and see him anyway, Marine. Will you call your superior and authorize us? Maddox looked at Chubb, then back to Jeff. He pulled out a data pad and checked it also. No Sijak, Jeff thought. Marines didn't use them. The Shahana claimed there was little possibility of the enemy learning anything from one, but yes, it was still our modern protocol to keep them off the Marines, who had a much higher than normal chance of being captured. I can authorize you myself, Maddox said. I can't open the door from this side, though, as a precaution. It'll take me a moment. Commander Maddox is head of Armada's Marines, Chuck noted as Maddox sat down in a chair beside the massive metal door in the brig. Commander, Jeff asked, your uniform says airmen. Yeah, Maddox said from his chair, this body is my runner. I leave the stripes off in case boarders are watching for officers. This body? Maddox went completely limp. A second later, the blast door opened, revealing Maddox, only a much taller version, well-muscled, uh, and wearing full board boarding armor and carrying a wicked-looking gun. Jeff glanced at the limp body beside the door. They were the same, only the less muscled body's eyes were no longer cracked. In fact, they stared sightless as if dead. You're a jumper, Jeff said, finally remembering what the broken eyes indicated. Maddox nodded, leaving, waving for them to follow. Jeff hurried after, entering a small, uh, narrow metal hallway. Slits on the sides revealed gun emplacements beyond, and Jeff shivered. Anyone trying to run down this hallway could easily find themselves in a death trap, bullets, bullets spraying at them every step. I didn't think there were any ju jumpers left, Jeff said, catching up to Maddox. Didn't the program, program get scrapped? Yeah, Maddox said, each footstep thumping now that he wore his heavily armored body. We kept losing soldiers, sir, Chuck explained. They'd jump from one body, then never appear in the new one. They'd just leave behind empty, behind empty bodies, staring sightlessly. No one ever returned. Drooled a whole lot, though. And Jeff shivered. So each time you jump, I might not arrive. Maddox said, I swore. But I don't think about it too much, Colonel. I am what I am. I simply make use of it the best I can. I suppose if I could keep two separate bodies, Jeff said, I might consider it to be worth the risk. They reached the end of the corridor and Maddox opened a door here, which turned and then turned to Jeff and smiled. What makes you think I only have only two, Colonel? Jeff raised an eyebrow, but didn't press for more information. He was growing too excited about what would come next. Together with Chug and Maddox, he stepped into a large, onto a large causeway that ran around a steel box of a room, two stories high. Marines in full armor stood at mounted guns here, spotlights shining from the ends and pointing at the floor below. At least they were taking proper precautions. Jeff counted two dozen Marines here, not including the ones hiding behind the kill slits in the corridor. Maddox stepped up to him and up to a female Marine who had been guarding the door. She saluted him. Any changes? He asked. No, sir. Maddox waved Jeff to follow him, led him down the causeway. A row of cells covered one wall below, but there didn't seem to be anything in them. If the admin had carried any other prisoners before today, they had all been shipped out. That meant their sole prisoner was in the cells underneath Jeff's feet. He suppressed a shiver, though he couldn't tell if it was born of excitement or nervousness. Maddox led him along the causeway as his soldiers shuffled their feet in an odd pattern, several of them stamping while they slid to the sides and kept their guns, set up their guns in new positions. And to keep the centurion from knowing where they ended up settling, Jeff realized. If the monster somehow escaped, it wouldn't know exactly where to, to target its attacks. How disorienting would it be, gunfire falling, gunfire falling on you, blinded by spotlights, trying to escape? I'm sweating, Jeff realized, as they reached a small lift with open sides. Maddox pointed for Chung, chugged the weight above, then lowered himself and, Seth and Jeff down to the floor below. They hugged the wall and rounded to stand before the empty cells, facing toward the ones under the causeway they crossed above. These were deep and dark, but Jeff could make out a hulking form inside the middle of the three. Something shifted in there. Valor was huge. Maddox made a fist, and one of the soldiers above shined their spotlights into the cell. And Jeff got his first view, or got his first in-person look at one of the knockers. Its head brushed the ceiling of the cell, which, would, which had to be seven feet tall and the knocker probably could have stood taller if it hadn't been forced to stoop. Its entire body was covered in silvery bits of metal. 
They actually grafted it onto their skin somehow, melding with it and creating armor plates that attach to their body. Indeed, as it stepped forward, trailing a ripped cloak that matched its deep red uniform, Jeff could see that it had long, knife-like metal spurs sticking out of the wrist and extending along the backs of the hands. Its head was enormous, covered in bits of iron plate. It looked vaguely reptilian, with golden eyes and deep, leathery skin, underneath the grafted-on chunks of steel. The back of the skull bulged outward in five wicked knobs. The hands were big enough they could have palmed the watermelon each. Jeff had to resist taking a step backwards as the knocker general walked to the bars of his cage, squinting, focusing despite the spotlight on it. You, the creature said softly, are the lurker. It spoke English. Well, I, Jeff's mouth was dry. Yes, the centurion said, its hands, which had metal bits embedded along the fingernails, scraping the bars as it moved along them. I can see it, lurker. Time to assert myself, Jeff thought. He stepped forward, meeting the thing's eyes. I am Jeffrey Salazar, and I'm the one who defeated you. Now, the creature would either bow before his dominance or rage against him, seeking to destroy him. He waited for it, curious to see which... I... Jeff licked his lips. Why was his mouth so dry? I challenge your authority. You must respond. My authority? The alien raised its enormous hands toward the cell. This authority? He shook his head. We have been bested, you and I both. And so it ends. He looked at Jeff, and then, in a distinctly chilling move, he smiled. That smile, there was so much wrong with it. Why would a knocker use a human facial expression? How much did this creature know? Why was it quoting Shakespeare? The knockers were brutes, driven by instinct. That's what he'd written, that's what he learned it. The alien's smile deepened, and he closed his eyes again. The game is done, he whispered. Farewell. Jeff stumbled back, feeling sick. He had been wrong. Whatever he thought he'd known about the knockers and their society, he'd been wrong. His expertise had supposedly won this war, but it turned out that he had no idea what he was talking about. Take me away, he said to Maddox. Now. Mm -hmm. um, that's called Adamant. Um, and so the premise that made me want to start writing it was this idea of um, basically Silence of the Lambs in space. Uh, right after this, humankind's going to be betrayed by the nice aliens who have given them this sidejack technology and helped them in their war against the violent knockers. And it turns out they didn't play it the whole time. Um, the nice aliens just want a nice race of, uh, of obedient soldiers. Um, they turn off the sidejack, knock out the entire command staff of the Armada. Um, and that leaves Jeff, who doesn't have one, who's not really a commander in charge. Um, he's able to grab the, the flagship and fly away with the Centurion in the brig, who is the greatest military mind that the galaxy has ever known. And so what follows is the story of him trying to get the um, Centurion to give him advice on tactics in the war against the quote-unquote nice aliens, while the Centurion is trying to figure out how to escape and get away from him. Um, and so it's a, it's a very fun story um, from there, um, but um, it's not ready to be released. One of the things I'm thinking of doing is if I can s maybe slide this into the Cosmere, I haven't decided yet, um, it would be really fun to get it in there. Um, I think it could, I just would have to lose the Shakespeare line. Um, and that's, that's kind of hurting me because I like that line. So we'll see. Um, we'll see if I, can, if, I can, if I can get it in or not. But anyway, thank you guys very much. Um, the, what I'm going to do is I'll probably do like four or five novellas. Um, that build, so it's like a novel told in novella form. I kind of imagine basically doing some episodes, quote unquote, right? Um, and then having like a six quote unquote episode season with the last episode being the end, so mini series basically. Um, kind of like uh, it was done with, um, with uh, oh, what was that big novella sequence that was uh, Dust? No, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, what's that? Wool, that's what it was. It's kind of like what was done with Wool. I think that the, the serial has a chance of coming back. Uh, because of ebooks and things like that. So, um, anyway, thank you guys very much. I'll be signing.